Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Today, I'm talking with William H. Sheberg. He is a scholar and rare book dealer based in Fairfield, Connecticut. The results of William's 11 years of research and seven years of thoughtful evaluation and writing can be found in his book, Writing the Big Book, The Creation of AA. It's a scholarly work that challenges many of AA's creation myths. William, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. So what inspired you to put this book together? It's pretty hefty. Um, you know, it's about 700 pages. I can see why this took you so many years to, to put together. But what got you so interested to write something so detailed? Well, this is my second book, actually. The first book was on the German philosopher Nietzsche. And I got involved with that because I couldn't figure out what was and what wasn't a first edition in his, his publication history. Uh, this book was kind of similar. I, I, uh, before the book Alcoholics Anonymous, which, which a members lovingly refer to as the big book, before the big book was published in April of 1939, two months before that, uh, they circulated uh, a multilith copy, an offset printed copy of the text for comments and critiques. And I, I bought a copy of that, one of those multilith copies at auction. And of course, as a rare book dealer, the question was, how rare was it? And when I looked at the secondary literature, some people said there were 100 copies, others said 200, 300. Bill Wilson, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, frequently said 400 copies. So I finally got permission to go down to the archives at the AA General Service Office in New York City. And uh, I was looking for the invoice. I was looking for the invoice from February of 1939. I knew it was $165. I had found that much solid information online. But I, I didn't know how many copies had been printed. And I thought maybe I could uh, nail that down by finding the invoice. I never found the invoice. I'm still not exactly sure how many copies were printed. But I, I started looking farther. Because I couldn't find the invoice, I started looking farther back into the story. I just got fascinated with the backstory of how the book Alcoholics Anonymous was put together and finally brought to press. And most especially, uh, I have a number of friends and even a couple of relatives in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'd heard a lot of stories over the years about early AA histories that they had told me. And I was a little bit surprised to find out that the documents that I was finding from 1939, 1938, 1937 didn't really line up all that well with some of those stories. Fascinating. Well yeah, so so this is interesting. So you were just doing it from a, a book dealer point of view, and then you got taken down a, a, a train, <laughs> a, a very Trying long train. Kind of went train. down the rabbit hole, Doctor. <laughs> yeah, rabbit hole, that's a, that's a good one. Um, and so um, can you just let us know, uh, not not everybody, of course, is involved in Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and the, the big book is um, pretty important for the program. Can you just give us some of um, what it's treated like now and then we'll go into that history that you found. Like, it, as you said, it is called the big book for a reason, and it is almost treated like a Bible for people in in the program. Um, what what um, how important is that? The book is completely central to the to the to the program and to the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. The book was published uh, eighty years ago, and it's it's still the central. A document that's used for people who are trying to recover from alcoholism. Um, you know, it's uh, there, there's AA at the moment it, it, in an anonymous organization. It's hard to get data. Let's face it, but there, AA is very clear that it's over two million people sober in Alcoholics Anonymous today, and the book was published 80 years ago. I mean, millions and millions and millions of people have had their lives saved and turned around by what was written in this book and what was published in 1939. Uh, it's it's you know the the twelve and and the twelve step program which is specifically for alcoholics in this book the twelve step program has been adopted over and over and over again by other groups in in the in the ensuing um, eighty years I, I called the general service office of AA several months ago to ask them how many twelve step programs did they know about 
And the woman said, well, we don't really keep a strict, you know, we don't really monitor that much, but I have a list here. And I said, well, how many have you got on the list? And she said, there's 680 12-step programs on the list. I think it's easy, easily uh, categorizable, the Alcoholics Anonymous movement, as one of the great spiritual movements of the 20th century. I think it's arguably the most important spiritual movement to come out of the 20th century. It's had vast that impact on, on millions of people. Well, and it, it definitely has a 12-step programs or something that we all, we're, we're very aware of. Um, you know, everybody hears, hears that. And, um, and you know, we hear the, the terms, you have to work the program. And, um, and so this, this all came from, from this book that was written 80 years ago. And, and over the years, has this book changed at all? No, the text, well, the, the book has two parts. The first part is, is exposition, let's call it, and the back half of the book are personal stories, Cle- clearly, uh, usually about 25 stories, personal stories in the back. There have been four editions of the big book since it was published 80 years ago, and uh, the front half of the book, the exposition part, has been very, very lightly edited over the years. Minor changes have been made to that. The stories in the back with each of the four editions were changed and updated to, to better reflect the, uh, the membership of Alcoholics Anonymous at the time and, and, and to appeal to the sensibilities of people who would likely be reading them in each of those different time frames. So, um, but no, the, the, the program as it was formulated and written down in 1939 has not been changed in any kind of substantive way since then. Well, and, and so these stories are, are pretty integral to the program. Um, you know, they they are what um, alcoholics are supposed to um, relate to when they're trying to find meaning in their own steps and their own program. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, since you've studied this <laughs> way more than I have. Um, but, but you know, I, I can see why those stories would need to change, because they would um, need to be accurate for the time period that we're in. Um, but, but is this how the first book came about? Was it just a story? Well, the first book, uh, the stories were, were ancillary to the book. The story supported what was in the front of the book. It told individual people's experience with how they actually applied that in their lives and how it turned them around and, uh, and uh, allowed them to live a life of, of useful and productive sobriety. Um, but the front of the book was Wilson talked about the you know they were they were really trying to write about what had happened to them and what they had found in that period uh, before the book came out that actually worked. Bill Wilson, the founder of AA, um, he called the period between the time when he got sober in December of 1934 and the and the publication of this book in April of 1939. He called that period the flying blind period. And what he meant by that was we didn't really have a 12-step program. We didn't have a formula. It wasn't written down someplace. There wasn't a uh, suggested program of recovery, as he calls it in the book, uh, for how to go about getting sober. Uh, in that flying blind period, uh, they were trying one thing and another. In, in the early days, they were <laughs> some of the things they tried were were uh, almost comical but 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 they were they were looking for what what worked and what didn't work and uh, and and that was what wilson was trying to do when he sat down to write this book in mid 1938 was to synthesize that experience and to, and to formulate it into a a program that people could actually uh follow step by step to uh to effectuate their own sobriety well, and, and so this is interesting. Did you find um, some of the things that they had tried before they discovered the 12-step program? Oh, yeah, there was. I, I, quite frankly, it was a little bit outside of my area of experience, but then, you know, the famous story is that uh, uh, Bill Wilson gets Dr. Bob Smith sober out in Akron, Ohio, he, and he's the first man who stays continuously sober. He's considered to be AA number two. And, um, and out in Ohio, they were... They were having people drink uh, tomato juice and uh, 
and Cairo syrup mixed together. They thought that, you know, the uh, something in the acidic value of tomato juice and the the sugar involved in the Cairo syrup was what an, uh, what an, uh, someone going through alcoholic withdrawal symptoms, the first, not just the first couple of days, but the first weeks, uh, that that would alleviate them. And people, people were drinking tomato juice and Cairo syrup. That got, that got left by the wayside after a year or two, but, but that's one of the things they were doing in the beginning. Well, they they did that for a year. It must have given them something to keep going. Well, um, somebody you thought know, they were doing it. Yeah, they were. And in the beginning, was, in the beginning, they were deeply involved and tied with a, a, a movement called the Oxford Group. Uh, the Oxford Group was uh, founded in 1921 by Frank Buchman. It was a it was a return to first century Christianity movement, and it's really the seeds out of which uh, Alcoholics Anonymous grew. And in the beginning of AA's history in 1935 and 1936 and 1937, um, both the New York group, Bill Wilson's group, and the Akron group, Dr. Bob's group, were deeply involved with the, with the Oxford group and uh, ascribed very much to its uh, principles and practices. Um, Wilson uh, moved away from the Oxford group in mid-1937. Dr. Bob didn't really make a formal break with the Oxford group until late 1939. But those were things that uh, the Oxford Group had a lot of things that they suggested people do, and they tried some of those, and some of those worked, and they kept doing them, and some of them didn't work, and they stopped doing them. Hmm. Well, and I I think that uh, this is... I, I would be surprised if they said that they started one program and it was the first one that worked and and off they yeah. went. I, you know, and and we know that twelve step programs are. Um, I'm not sure if there are stats on on how well it works. Or, um, you know, because people say that you have to start and stop um, a multiple per- times before a program will stick and work for you. And this is a common story, I think, with, with a lot of addictions. Um, you know, I, I talk to people, um, in office about sugar a lot and, and I, I explain that it's uh, very addictive and, and that it's called that for a reason. It's called an addiction for a reason. It's not logical. And so we can't just expect that we can look at ourselves in the mirror and say you're not going to eat sugar anymore and then off we go mm-hmm. and and life is going to go on um, so you know when you take an addiction like alcoholism that's that's ruining lives um, well I mean not that sugar doesn't but it's a more obvious way I think when alcohol is involved and um, um, I think that you can't just say oh we did this one thing and it worked and, and off we went I think it's um, makes sense that they tried more than one thing and and had some failures. Yeah, and it took them a while to actually figure out what it was that was working. Um, My understanding of the basic AA program um, that I've gotten from reading this book as carefully as I possibly could, and also the earlier versions and how it morphed into what was finally published, uh, my basic understanding of AA is that... uh, Bill Wilson's genius came out when he said the first principle is that if you're a real alcoholic, and he used that phrase, real alcoholic, you have no defense against the first drink. So a lot of people looked at alcoholism and thought the problem was after somebody started drinking, they couldn't stop. Bill said the problem was when you're sober, if you're a real alcoholic, sooner or later, no matter what promises you make to your to your to your loved ones, your 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 children, your parents, your boss, sooner or later, you're going to pick no booze in your body. You're still going to pick up that first drink. You have no defense against against the first drink. Um, And the second principle is, as I understand it, oh, except there is one thing you can do to to distance yourself from the first drink. If you have a, quote, vital spiritual experience, that can get between you and the first drink. And the more you enlarge and grow that and and, and, uh, work at having a, a more vital, vital spiritual experience, the more distance you can get between you and the drink. And that's my basic, I mean, there's a, lot, there's a lot more to the AA program than that, but in a nutshell, I think it comes down to Wilson's understanding that the problem is something that happens before an alcoholic picks up a drink. There's the problems in his mind, not in, in, his, in, in, in his, what happens to him after he drinks. Um, so you, you're, you have no defense against the first drink. Oh, yes, you do. You could, you could get yourself a vital spiritual experience. 
And the vital spiritual experience, the 12 steps, are, are the suggested program for getting a vital spiritual experience. The 12 steps, the first words of the 12 steps are having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. Mm. That's, in a nutshell, that's how it's supposed to work. Doesn't work for I know it doesn't work for everybody. Wouldn't it be nice if it did? That would just be fabulous. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I don't. I don't think, to be honest, life is that easy. Um, that we've got something that works for everybody, and and we don't have these challenges that you know make us grow. Um, but you know, it, it it's. I I am happy that they made a program because until then, I mean, did we have anything that that was working at all? And I know back then there was an issue a big issue with alcohol uh, not that there isn't today but um, was there anything that was working or being done no uh, there were things that were tried and it would, 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 would seem to be working and then it would fall apart I mean America's had this tremendous history with alcoholism and especially after the Civil War when the temperance movement took off uh, temperance movement just grew and grew and grew in its its, its effectiveness and uh, eventually culminated in the in the uh, you know the prohibition amendment to the constitution uh, so that there was no booze in the United States from 1920 to 1933 uh, legally available and people thought that was a solution. We just keep them away from it. Keep them away from it. But alcoholics are going to find a drink one way or the other, no matter what. So this this grand um, march of history from the Civil War right up until the 1930s, uh, you know, the, the, the culminates in in something that's a complete disaster. Complete disaster doesn't work at all. And people people just had no idea where how they could come at or how they could go at about uh, solving this problem of alcoholism. Very shortly after that, Bill Wilson gets sober. He gets sober in December of 1934, and he thinks he's got an answer. In the early years, they talked about it as a cure. They stopped doing that after a while, but they thought they had a cure in the beginning. How interesting, huh? Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about that um, more when we get back from this break. Um, we're talking today with William H. Shaberg, and um, he wrote the book, Writing the Big Book, The Creation of AA. We'll be back shortly. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single-day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480 294 6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com again that's jeff spinard at 480-294-6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com voice america is where you are and where you want to be join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available don't forget to view all our live events including on-demand access to past events that you may have missed by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events Have you become a member yet? Sign up now to become a member of Voice America. It's always free and easy. Plus, you get to take advantage of some great member benefits. Get unlimited access to millions of hours of on-demand content across all of our channels. Keep track of your favorite episodes, shows, and hosts in your own customizable library. Find out what shows you might be interested in based on your favorites. Plus, you get insider access with our newsletter. Membership gives you more. Sign up at voiceamerica.com and click register at the top right. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1 866 472 5792. Again, that's 1 866 472 5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. 
Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today we're talking with William Shaberg, and we're discussing his book, um, Writing the Big Book. Um, so, William, you, I mean, the, the subtitle, um, or I guess you get into this being, you know, AA's creation myths. And um, you know, what did you find when you were digging around that, that was a myth? Well, there, there was, quite frankly, a number of things. You know, I've been asked by a number of people, so what was the most, you know, the interesting thing or the, or the most shocking thing you found? And it's just like there isn't just one thing. There were so many different things uh, that were just not quite on the mark with the stories that have been told. The first chapter of the book is called uh, Challenging the Creation Myths, and, and the next 30 chapters does that over and over and over again. Um, the problem is that, that Bill Wilson, uh, the founder of AA, was, uh, was, a, was a fabulous, fabulous storyteller, but he, he was just a terrible historian. I mean, he wasn't trying to tell a, a historically accurate story when he told these stories. He was, he was trying to sell a message of recovery to, uh, to people who were suffering from alcoholism. I mean, there was a man with a, had this, this grand, universal, uplifting, deeply spiritual, life-saving vision. And, 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 and he told stories that, that, had, uh, that he was trying to craft so that they had maximum impact uh, and uh, that many had to leave a lot of the, mil- the messy details aside. And that uh, things that he related as being like, this is how it happened stories wasn't really how it happened. They were much more parables and sometimes drifted right over into myth. Um, but but it's completely understandable. In the beginning, I had a little pushback on that myself. I was like, I've always had kind of admired Wilson, what I'd heard about him. Uh, and, it, you know, so I, people say to me, well, are you, are you calling Bill Wilson a liar? And, well, no, that's not what we're talking about at all. Here was a man who was, who was, who was preaching a message of recovery. And, and, and he wasn't preaching, but he wasn't a guy who was preaching salvation in the next world. He was preaching salvation in this world, in the here and now. And he, and he just... He pared those stories down so that they made the point he wanted to make and so that he, it would have the impact, hopefully, that he wanted it to have. Um, certainly, those are two of the big things. He was getting rid of messy details, and he was, he was mythologizing things and, and making them parables uh, for greater impact. But he, he also uh, he had problems with uh, being revered. As soon as people started getting sober, they started just revering Bill Wilson. And he told a bunch of stories that gave credit to other people. It was his way of taking the spotlight off himself. Um, and he did a lot of that. Um, and, and then, of course, there's leaving out uh, uncomfortable facts. I mentioned the, the Oxford group, for instance, and there was a lot of people in the late 30s that the Oxford group was not uh, they were not a popular organization with them. So uh, Wilson just had to left, he kind of left that out of the story when he started telling stories about A's early day, very, very uh, minimized the Oxford group's influence far beyond, uh, far below the kind of influence it actually had. So what, were, what was the big shock? The, the most important thing that came through to me when all was said and done was um, Bill Wilson is frequently referred to today in AA circles as the co-founder of AA, and Dr. Bob Smith in you know, Akron, Ohio, was the, the other co-founder of AA. Um, personally, uh, I, 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 just, I have a hard time just, rap, just getting on board with that. First of all, I don't think there was a co-founder to begin with. Bill Wilson was the founder of AA, and he's the guy so primarily responsible for it. He, there's, there's, there's no co-founder thing going on. But if there is a co-founder thing to be uh, an accolade, uh, a co-founder white hat to be given out, it doesn't go to Bob Smith, in my opinion. It goes to a man named Hank Parkhurst, uh, somebody who almost most people in AA have never even heard of. Uh, Hank Parkhurst was the first man that Bill Wilson got sober when he came back to New York from Ohio in late 1935, and, and Bill and Hank were just joined at the hip. And it was really Hank Parkhurst who pushed Bill Wilson over and over and over again to get this book written and to get it out and get it published. And I'm, 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 I frequently say, no Hank, no book. And I really believe that's true. There certainly would not have been a book published called Alcoholics Anonymous in April of 1939 if it wasn't for Hank Parkhurst. We might have had a, A might have had a book later, and it would have been a different kind of book, but the book that was published in April of 1939 was very much, it was Bill Wilson wrote it, but he wrote it with Hank Parkhurst looking over his shoulder and beating him over the head with, to get his own perspective into that book. So why has nobody heard of Hank Parkhurst? 
Nobody's heard of Hank Parkers because six months after the book was published, Hank Parkers was drunk, and he never got sober again. So you don't want to tell a story about the second most important guy in the production of this book and then have to admit that it didn't work for him, that he got sober. So Hank got dropped out of the story. And one of the things I found over and over again going through the documents, the primary documents from 37, 38, and 39, was how just unbelievably critical and central his role was in this thing. He's not just the unsung hero. If there's a co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's Hank Parkhurst. Mm. Um, so you think that, that Bill Wilson changed the story? I, I mean, it sounds like he changed the story to give hope to people. I mean, leaving out somebody who was integral to um, writing the book but wasn't sober would, of course, make people not want to follow a program that they might think exactly. doesn't work. Exactly. Yeah. Of yeah. It wasn't like a great selling point, you know. We got this yeah. wonderful car over here, but it breaks down after ten thousand miles. You know, it was, it's not a it's not a good selling yeah. pitch. So, yeah, he he didn't go in that direction. Now, Bill wrote a history book about AA called uh, AA A Comes of Age in nineteen fifty five, I think. And uh, and Hank gets mentioned in there a few times because he could not tell the story of the production of the book without mentioning Hank Parker's. But it's it's very. It's kind of a drive-by mention. Each one's a drive-by mention. Nobody's nobody's talking about this man's centrality and the way he's central here in the story, and again here in the story, and again here in the story, and again here in the story. And that's one of the things that comes out of my book with a vengeance is how critically important and how much of a second important player Hank, Hank Parkhurst is in the, in the production of this book. Well, I wonder, I mean, we understand now, I don't know how much we knew in 1934, about how much hope people need to um, to get through life, really, and, and to, um, you know, get through a hard day and to get through something as difficult as alcoholism. And I do think that it was... Um, it, because there was nothing that worked back then, I think people weren't functioning as much as they can now. Um, I, I don't know. I wasn't there in 1934. Maybe you can um, say something about that. But I, I think that he probably felt um, that he needed to give people that shining hope. And here's a program. And here's some hope. Because if you don't hand a program like that to people who are at the rock bottom, it, there it, it, there is how can they follow through and think that it's going to work at all? So it seemed like something that he had to do to to help people. And, and he, I'm sure, understood where they were because he had been there. Exactly. And when Bill told, I mean, the first chapter of the book, of the big book, is, is called Bill's Story. And it's, it's his kind of autobiographical account of his drinking and getting sober. Uh, and it, I think it's a, it, it sends a powerful message to, let's just say, some random alcoholic. Pick, you know, his wife gives him the book, or he picks up this book, or, or her husband gives her the book, uh, and and they they the book leads right off with with uh, 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 what they call the doctor's opinion, a little bit of medical advice, 1939 medical advice, and then it launches right into Bill's story, so that you could, you, you you got a, a, a an upfront tale of hope about a real person. You're not going into the theory of how this thing works. You're talking about how it worked for this one, this one man. And, uh, and I think that was a, a smart move uh, on one of the editor's point to move Bill's story, which had been in the back of the book, to the front of the book so that it could give people that kind of concrete hope from the very, very beginning of uh, that reading experience. Mm, which was important. Now, um, your, your book being 700 pages, was there more that you discovered as you were doing um, the research that that you reported on? Well, yeah, there's a bunch of, there's so many of these AA myth kind of things. You know, uh, uh, one of them was that 100 men wrote this book. Uh, and and the, way, the way the beginning of the book is written, it, it basically imp- if it doesn't say that, it implies it strongly. And Bill Wilson wrote this book. He, he, wrote, he wrote every chapter of the book except for one, which uh, to the employer, uh, to employers, which Hank Parkhurst wrote. He was the businessman. He was more of a businessman than Bill Wilson was. Uh, certainly, that was one of, the, one, of the, uh, one of the mythologies that people talk about all the time. But all of the, all of the stories that get told about AA, they're all so... Kind of, uh, kind of, kind of, 
spiritually or you know there's just this it, it doesn't have the human element to it it's much more of a godly element to it uh and uh, there's bill there was this wonderful quote from uh, that bill got while he was researching for this uh, history book he did in 1954 dorothy schneider an early member uh, around aa her husband was one of the first people to get sober she said she said the people talk as though there were 100 men and they all went saintly and were taken straight up to heaven. And God just guided Bill's hand. And that Bill just sat there and let the words come through. Actually, she said, it wasn't anything like that at all. And no, it wasn't anything like that at all. It was a much, much, much more human story. It was a story of fits and starts. It was a story that could have gone off the rails uh, any number of times um, during the, the, the 18-month period that I'm... I'm covering here, although they could have gone off the rails a number of times even before they started thinking about writing a book. I mean, halfway through this 18-month period, Bill Wilson's already written two chapters. They've sent them out. They're trying to raise some money with this. It's June of 1938, and according to Lois's diary, she and Bill have a fight. And he's so furious that he runs out of the house, and he tells her he's going out to get drunk. But instead of getting drunk, instead of picking up that first drink, he goes over to New Jersey to his friend Hank Parker's house. And stays there. Now, if Bill Wilson had had a slip, what they call a slip, back into drinking in June of 1938, I doubt that Alcoholics Anonymous as an organization would even be here today. I mean, mm -hmm. Bill's credibility would have been completely destroyed. The program of recovery and the credibility of that, what he had been doing, would have been completely destroyed. So there's this, <laughs> I love the visual image of Bill racing mm -hmm. out of the Browns. You know, the hell with you, I'm going to go get drunk. <laughs> and, and, not yeah. it. And, and, and what I really, really would love to have been a fly on the wall, they, they were having, um, there was two meetings in the world during this time. There was one on Wednesday night in Akron and one on Tuesday night in Brooklyn at Bill's house in Brooklyn. I would love to have known if Bill owned the fact that he almost drank the following Tuesday when, when the guys got together. There were, there were no women in New York AA at that time. Mm -hmm. When the guys got together on Tuesday night, I wonder if he admitted that he had been that thirsty, that he had uh, come that close to slipping. Uh, well, that's what the no meetings way. were for. You, but, but, you know, if he was trying to, to be hopeful for other people, he may not have <laughs> come as clean. I guess we'll never know. <laughs> Hopefully yeah, he we'll did. never know. It's too yeah. bad. Too bad. Too bad. There's, there's yeah. lots of times where I would have liked to have been a fly on the wall and have heard, gotten more information that I could find from the printed documents. But uh, mm -hmm. we, we just have to deal with what we got. So. So do you think that, that that godly writing of, you know, these hundred men became saintly was was something that, that was needed for the, the hope that people needed in AA, or was that something that was common in 1934 to kind of talk and present things like that? I think, yes, absolutely. I, I believe that, you know, the, the, the culture in the United States of America in 1939 was completely, completely different from 2019. I mean, it's, we've, we've, I mean, everybody went to church in 1939, and it was important to know what church you went to. And people who didn't go to church were known for not going to church, and that was kind of a black mark. The religious culture of, of uh, America in the 30s was, was profound, deep, and wide. I mean, it was just everywhere. So telling the stories and understanding the stories in relation to that sort of, uh, in, 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 in that sense, the Judeo-Christian, uh, divinely inspired um, telling of that story uh, makes perfect sense, perfect sense coming out of that, that particular culture. But, um, but when, when you look at what was going on, Again, on a day-to-day -day basis, I was amazed when I got in the archives how much material there was for starters, and also the fact that I could find no references to to just many, just tons of that material in any of the secondary literature. Because most of the AA secondary literature that's been produced in the last 80 years depends on the stories that Bill Wilson told. Because he's the guy, he's the founder, he's the he's you know he's the he's the equivalent of the infallible source, and. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all those, all those stories didn't have the, the wealth of detail that was preserved in the documents in the archives. And, uh, and that, was, that was the black hole I went into. That was the rabbit hole I went down, and, and, uh, and I was just, just amazed at what I found down there, just like Alice was. 
<laughs> well, yeah, it seems like it opened a bit of a, a Pandora's box, especially because this this book has been studied extensively by millions of people in the in the program, and um, you know, I, I think it has been treated like a Bible and like a a new um, I want to say religion. It's not a religion, but it it when you're that desperate and you're looking for those answers, people do work the program and study the book, and and you know that's how they they get sober and and stay sober in this program Mm -hmm. and and you're throwing a bit of a wrench at it saying well it might not be (laughs) the way it's been presented and and studied all these years well i just think it's it's more complicated and more complex and as i said more human the stories that bill wilson told and the stories the the canonical stories that have been passed down about early a history are are, tell a story uh, that that it was miraculous that AA survived and produced this book and then and then grew from that point forward, it's a miraculous story. Personally, it's, I, I'm, I really firmly believe that the human elements, when you bring in the human elements and look at them in detail, the, my book tells a, a much, much more miraculous story than the canonical stories do. I think, it's, mm-hmm. I think it's unbelievably amazing that AA survived that flying blind period and got to the point where they, they put the program of recovery down on paper so that so the people could then use that as a launching point for for getting sober and spreading the word around the country and then around the world um, mm-hmm. you know the book is yeah. the book has been uh, uh, there's been 37 million copies of this book printed in in English alone and i think it's been translated into 24 languages yeah that's pretty amazing um, we're going to talk about this more when we get back we're going to take a quick break we're talking today with William H. Shaberg and we're discussing his book Writing the Big Book and we'll be back shortly Opinions Options Answers You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness Take us on the go. It's even easier now. The Voice America Talk Radio Network has a mobile app for iOS, Android, or Amazon Kindle. Visit the Apple App Store, Amazon, or Google Play to download the app powered by Aircast. It's free and no registration is necessary. In minutes, you could be enjoying your favorite Voice America Talk Radio host no matter where you are, in the car, out and about, while traveling, or anytime you can't be close to your computer. Catch up on the archives you've missed or discover new shows on the spot. Search Voice America at your favorite app store. We're on the pulse of the world with great shows and hosts. The Voice America Health and Wellness Channel is also on Twitter. We've got ideas to keep you healthy, breaking health news, and more. Follow us on Twitter at Voice AM Health. That's at Voice AM Health. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with William H. Shaper, and we're discussing his book, Writing the Big Book. So, uh, William, you know, we... You you've been busting these myths on on how this the Alcoholics Anonymous book had been um, written. Now, ha, has this how has this been received um, with people in the program? Are are they happy to to know the the full story, or, or are they um, upset that their their myths have been busted? You know, the, first of all, the book's only been out a couple of weeks. So I haven't got a lot of feedback yet, but I've done a couple of recent presentations uh, to uh, crowds of uh, 50, 60 people each, and and it's been interesting. People, some people are taken aback, and they 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 kind of cross examine me. But you know, I heard this, and I, and but but doesn't that contradict what you just said? And and 
I've, I've got the, the documents and the details at my fingertips in most cases. Um, and, and people have been, uh, been really, I think, I think they've, they've accepted it and received it really, really well. Um, I did a presentation about a year ago. Uh, Bill Wilson uh, and, and his wife Lois lived uh, in Westchester, just north of uh, New York City, uh, uh, at a house that, that was called Stepping Stones, and it's a national whatever monument kind of thing today, and they have a great archive there. But I did a presentation there about a year ago uh, to 20 people, and they were the docents and the, the, some of the board members from Stepping Stones. And it was an interesting thing for me because half of the people were very, very, they just loved the presentation. They loved the fact that they were getting the quote-unquote real story. Uh, but the other half, people were, were really taken aback and, and not particularly pleased at all that I was that I was that I was changing the narrative so radically uh, but since that time um, I've, I've worked closely with the people at Stepping Stones on a number of projects and uh, and I, I think people are very happy to to have something a little bit more credible to have something a little bit more quite frankly lively certainly to have something more, way more detailed way more I've, there's details in this book that have never been published anywhere. Uh, so I, I'm not really sure um, where it's going to be going from here. Uh, I think the biggest problem is going to be uh, with people in Ohio. Uh, Dr. Bob Smith, as I said, was in Akron, Ohio, and uh, he is revered there. Um, and they always had kind of a low opinion of Bill Wilson uh, in, in Ohio. They, and uh, and quite frankly, one of the things that comes out of my book is 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 how uh, how negative the people in Ohio were on this whole book project. How almost they contributed almost nothing to the front half of the book. Uh, Bill was always begging for comments and suggestions back from Doctor Bob, and Bob was telling Bill that they they thought it, they thought it was good. That's good. That's good. He wasn't getting anything back from them. So I think mm-hmm. the people in Ohio are not not going to be happy with this book at all. But um, <laughs> I've said to people who have, who have braced me on particular things, I said, you know, there's, there's uh, 416 informational footnotes in this book, and there's 1,560 citations in the back for um, where that particular quote or document or idea came from. So if, if, if you can find another document, or if you think I misinterpreted a document, I've got ten appendices in this book of the important the important things so that people can actually see the entire documents. Um, I'm really really just trying to open up a dialogue about what what really happened. I mean, historians' job is always to get to what really happened, but we never ever ever get to what really happened. I mean, I have trouble, you know telling the story about something that happened last week that my wife doesn't contradict me on some detail or another <laughs> so but but we're we're trying to get closer to what really happened, and and I think I think people once they they get involved with this story, appreciate those details and appreciate that perspective and appreciate the fact that it's so well documented. Well, and um, what what are you hoping that um, will come out of this by telling this story? Are you hoping to um, just shed a light on that time period? Are you hoping to maybe give people in the program a, a different perspective on on what happened? And you know, for me, I, I prefer the the real story of things because I think that you know we we in Hollywood and in society kind of shine this light saying everything's perfect and. I didn't have to work hard to get to where I am, and and you know life is hunky dory and easy. We do this on social media, etc. And to know the the real stories um, can actually be more helpful, which is what AA is based on. But then we find out the story isn't quite what we thought it was. So, what are you hoping is going to be taken from that? Um, well, certainly. One, I didn't write the book for this purpose, but it's certainly one of the things that came to me as I was writing it was, was to see the human background of this story. If, if you consider this book to be divine, or to really consider this book to be divinely inspired and, make, and that makes that text untouchable, which is what the General Service Conference, that's the controlling entity in Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, has decided you, you can't even change a comma in, in the first half of this book. Um, 
if, 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 you, if you get to that, I'm, I'm fine with not changing this book, but I certainly think it's time for a rewrite. We need, we need a new book. And if they don't come up with, uh, AA doesn't do a completely uh, new version of, of what it says in this particular book by uh, 2039, when it's 100 years old, I think shame on them. I mean, there's, there's a chapter in here, Two Wives. And, and, you know, so the presumption is that the man's the drunk and the wife is home taking care of the kids. Well, we know that's not true, but it's also, it's just, it's just freighted with 1930s stereotypes about women. And, and uh, I can't imagine a young woman coming into Alcoholics Anonymous today reading that chapter without being, just having a violent, uh, literally a violent reaction to it. But you've got to realize that when it was written, the women, women had only had the votes for 18 years when that chapter was written. Uh, similarly, the, the, the family afterwards. Those, I mean, two wives should be to your significant other or to your partner, but two wives and the family afterwards really needs to be completely rewritten, in my opinion, by people who are members of Al-Anon, which mm-hmm. is the, uh, the, the organization that was founded, I don't, I don't know how long, 15, 20 years after AA was founded, for people who are the spouses of or children of uh, alcoholics, and, uh, and and they've been a tremendously effective organization. But what it says in those two chapters has not, you know, just doesn't doesn't line up with what we understand today. Uh, Hank Parkhurst wrote the chapter to employers, and he describes a business climate that 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 disappeared somewhere between 1955 and 1970. It's just gone, and that whole thing needs to be rewritten so that so that we deal with the employee incentive program. You know, the, all the all the things that go on today with rehabs and insurance, and that needs to be acknowledged and dealt with. Similarly, the, the chapter on, on working with others uh, could mm-hmm. certainly be updated to, uh, it's a different climate that we live in today in relation to hospitals, hospitalization, and recovery uh, facilities that would need to be taken into account for that. And then the last chapter of the book is A Vision for You, and it talks about how successful things have been in Akron, Ohio. Well, there's been a lot of successes since 1939 that could well go into a, a complete rewrite of that chapter. Doesn't mean the front half, most especially the, the you know the, the chapters with the twelve steps and how to what the twelve steps are about. I think I think those could be updated certainly in language to make them more uh, comprehensible to people today. There's a number of stumbling blocks in there, words that nobody's familiar with anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I you know Bill Wilson complained bitterly. Uh, um, that in in the in early 1950s that the book was frozen. He, he really hated the fact that nothing could be changed. This is Bill Wilson in 1950. Mm-hmm. And the book's not even 15 years old. And, and, and in that particular letter, fascinating letter, he said to the guy, "I'm writing the, some new stuff, and hopefully that'll loosen things up a bit." And that was a book that came out uh, in 1953 or four, uh, called "12 Steps and 12 Traditions" that Wilson wrote, and. Uh, and so he thought that would loosen things up. But two or three years after that came out, he writes, in response to another letter he received, he writes a letter that says, now even that thing is frozen. And, and he said, if I were to try to change one word in the 12 steps, I would be excommunicated from Alcoholics Anonymous. So he was, he was dying to keep this thing much more vibrant uh, than uh, AA members, even in, well, he was alive, we're letting them do. Um, I, I just, I would really, really, really love to see uh, a new version of the book, a 21st century of the version of the book that takes into 21st century culture. And, and, and let's say if it's 2039, 100 years of experience. I mean, I mean, it says in the back of the book, more will be revealed to us. We know very little at the moment, but God will reveal more to us. Okay, so what's been revealed in the last 80 years, in the last, mm-hmm. or... If we get to 39, the next 100 years, I would, I would just love to see that happen. I think, I think, it, I think it's a much, much needed project. But I really have little to no hope that uh, the General Service Conference would agree with me on that. Well, I, I, I agree with you. Um, I can see why they 
don't want to change the book. Um, there, I think there's several reasons, but one, it is treated like a Bible. Um, and the other, I mean, we're these are people who are in a situation where their life is out of control. So if you change what's helping them get control, it's pretty mm-hmm. scary, right? And a lot of people have based years and years of sobriety on, on this book. But I do agree um, that it, you know, it should at least another version you can use the old one and then maybe just update the stories to include where society is now because we're not the same as we were in 1934 a lot of things are different and and society is different so i i think also the stories of getting sober and and um and all of that are going to be different because of just how things are now. I mean, we didn't have Instagram back then, and that can be part of somebody's body image issue or, or, you know, that kind of thing, or women weren't included. Um, So, you know, there needs to be a bit of a a shift, and hopefully that dialogue can um, get started for for some inclusion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I I, I don't think they should get rid of the old book i think, I think no. as an as an urge i think that's 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 unbelievably important i agree with that i just i just like to see really i think 2039 there should be a 21st century version of 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 what was written in the 20th century in 1939 that's that's one man's opinion mhm yeah. Well, um, now, if anybody wants to to read this book um, or get more information, how can they do so? Uh, thank you for asking. The easiest way to do that would be to go to my website, www.writingthebigbook.com. Um, and if you go there, there's a short video of me talking about the book. There's a table of contents is there if you want to see what, what's in the book. Uh, there's a sample chapter. There's the second chapter in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, today. is called There is a Solution. And uh, I've, I've, I've posted chapter eight, the one about Bill's writing of There is a Solution online. Uh, I had eight pre-publication readers, a historians primarily, read the book, and I've got their reviews and comments there. Um, and of course, there's a there's there's a short there's information about me and about appearances we're going to be doing. But there's also a couple of buttons you can click on for Amazon, Barnes and Noble, or my publisher, Central Recovery Press. Any any one of those three will take you to a website where you could order the book directly. Um. Writingthebigbook.com. Well, that, that's perfect. Um, I, I hope that, um, you know, this starts a, a good dialogue. I, I don't want uh, controversy to come with this. I think that, you know, y- you've um, made a story more real, and I think there's nothing that can, can be wrong with that. And um, I want to thank you for, for sharing that story with us today. Thank you, Doctor. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you. Thank you. And if anybody wants more information about my story and what I went through to get back to health, you can find that on my website at dr-risk.com. Feel free to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Uh, You can send me an email at anantacalgary at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening today. Be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week.